coming to you live from downtown Detroit. This is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel O'Connor. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, traders and investors. Welcome to this Thursday, January 26th edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. I'm Spencer Israel, here with Joel Conan and Dennis Dick. Today's show is once again brought to you by Chaikin Analytics with their groundbreaking stock research tools, including the proven Chaikin Power Gauge Rating and Stock Discovery Engine. Chaikin Analytics simplifies complex investment decisions, and it's all presented in an easy-to-understand platform. To learn more, visit, visit ChaikinAnalytics.com forward slash pre-market. That's Chaikin. C H A I K I N analytics.com forward slash pre market. You can see the discovery engine up on the screen right now. On today's show, we got two guests for you. First will be at 815. He is Keith Kern, supposed to be on the show yesterday. We're going to get him on today, though. He is the founder of Traders Toolbox. And then at 835, we're going to have Jeff Hirsch. He's the editor in chief of the stock. Traders Almanac. Joel, we have so many stocks reporting earnings today. I'm not even going to list them all. Let's just go right into it. How are we doing in the S&Ps? Uh, we're down just a half a point here at 93 and a half. Uh, hit a high of 99.50 in the pre-market session. So nice round number of 2300. We'll see if that comes into play on the downside. 91.75. That's your pre-market low. Uh, not much down uh, in that 80 handle. Uh, yesterday's intraday low, 22.84 and a quarter. Looking at the crude oil futures, up 34 cents. I was just noticing a lot of resistance up here on the daily chart at the 53.50, 53.60 area. So for more continued upside, actually a lot of consolidation here in the crude oil market. And gold well below 1,200 here, trading at 11.87. Why have your money in gold when you can be in stocks? Dennis, how are you doing on this Thursday morning? I was going to say Dow 20,000. Who wants to own gold? Exactly. You beat me to it, though. Before I was even on the show, you didn't give me a chance. All right. <laughs> and uh, Dennis, we're having a little bit of a debate here about the actual significance of uh, Dow 20K. And I... For me, I think if you look at it, you're comparing apples and oranges. When you look at the Dow from 1999, Alcoa, Allied Signal, Citigroup, General Motors, and you take out those either companies that either were low-priced or went off the board, and you replace it with Goldman Sachs, IBM, and a couple other high-priced stocks like that. I guess IBM was in before. You're really comparing apples and oranges. Just the, the construction of the index, we've argued this on the show before, you know, the construction of the Dow index, it's price weighted for one thing, meaning a stock like Goldman Sachs, a stock like IBM, because their higher price has more weight than a lower price stock, which I think is silly. And then the second thing, there's only 30 stocks in it. So, you know, is it really an indication of what's happening overall? I mean, it kind of, you know, is, but at the same time, that's why me and Joel prefer the S&P 500. But I will tell you, when, you know, somebody asks me and, you know, you get this question, you know, as a trader and the people I know, you're a stock trader, you get this question all the time from your friends. They go, what did the market do today? And, you know, I'll say S&P was up seven. They'll look at me puzzled and they'll be like, you know, this is from a non-trader. And they'll be like, what the hell is the S&P? They want to hear what the Dow did. Everybody wants to hear market was up 200 points. They don't want to hear market was up seven points. They don't want to hear market was up 20 points. They want to hear that the market was up 200 points. It's a bigger number. It's a number that everybody follows. So there is some psychological relevance to Dow 20,000. But that's it. It's all just from a psychological perspective. I will say nothing really from a technical perspective because I think most of your money managers and your institutional money managers and the big money – follows the S&P. So I would say it's more just from a psychological perspective than anything. All right. Well, I guess we can agree to – I guess we had pretty much an agreement on We did that. agree. We did agree. <laughs> Shoot. I thought we were going to have a little debate. <laughs> you want to fight with me this but, early. Uh, Joel's looking for a fight. S steak dinner. 20, I'll take 21000 You can have 19000 <laughs> nah. I am not betting on the Dow. I don't know anything about it. I don't even know where it is today. I know we hit 20000 there. 
because you know I had my hat on order, but I don't know where where is the Dow? Where do we close? We closed at twenty thousand sixty eight point five one, and uh, we're trading flat here. But let's. I do not... not have the Dow even on my screen now. I've officially taken it off now that it's at twenty thousand. I could care less. So S and P is littered all over the screen. I do not even have a Dow futures or Dow quote on my screen. That's how much I like the Dow. All right, we got a couple guests coming on today, so we have. 11 minutes to do, 10 minutes to do 20 earnings reports. You could do it. Yeah. We could do it. 20. There's like 200, <laughs> but yeah. We'll try to get the top 20 for you in here. So let's fly. Stock a minute. Spencer gives the numbers. And Okay, so this is how it's going to go. I'm going to give a symbol. Spencer's going to give the numbers, the earnings numbers in like 15 seconds. Joel's going to give you the levels in 15 seconds, and then we'll go. So it's going to be like less than a minute per stock. Let's start. Where, where do we want to start? This is important. So we've got to find the first one. To Caterpillar. You want to go to the cat? The cat. Oh, that's going to take more than a minute. Okay, Caterpillar, Spencer, go. CAT had, actually, this is an interesting one. CAT reported Q4 just EPS, 83 cents versus 66 cents. Sales of 9.57 versus 9.84 billion dollars. They see their fiscal year 17 sales uh, pretty much in line with the estimate, and the adjusted EPS uh, is a little bit lower. Gordon Johnson said to short this yesterday, heading, heading into the earnings report. Gordon Johnson would be correct here. And I'll tell you, we talked about this before, it's all about levels in the book, in the open book. 100 bucks, man. Big psychological hurdle for it. Where does it get in the pre-market? 99.90. So there you go. Stock is peeled off that level. Those big psychological levels, just like Dow 20,000, can work, Joel. But Joel, give us some levels. I uh, gave you on the upside. Where's the 96 thing going on the and a like, quarter. 96 and a quarter. That's your pre-market low. We've bounced off that trading 97.20. You know I like to keep an eye on the mark here. So no, no rally here until you can get above 98.15. I'm sure a lot of people would like to see that. That was the high close of the move. So there are my levels on the downside, 96 and a quarter, 98.15. Go to BMY uh, next for fuzzy. Bristol Myers. And this stock getting beat up even more. Everybody hates Bristol Myers. Poor Bristol Myers has earnings. You know, it gets beat up on Merck or or on their drug, lung lung cancer drug twice. And now they come out of their earnings, they beat them up again. So, Spencer, give us the details. Q4 adjusted EPS, 63 cents. That missed by 4 cents. Sales of 5.2 versus 5.13 billion. So, a slight beat there. Fiscal year adjusted EPS. The outlook for the for the year is 270 to $2.90. That's in line with the estimate, which is 286 you start looking at Bristol Myers just from a fundamental perspective here. This is why you know I had it and then I got rid of it because the multiple's too high. I mean, you're sitting here with a 16, 17 multiple going forward on a pharmaceutical company that's having some troubles right now. When you got Gilead sitting down there with a multiple of six going forward, so compare just comparing Bristol Myers, you know, to other you know pharmaceutical stocks in the industry, I think the valuation is too high. There's my fundamental talk. Joel, I'll give you the levels. I don't think they're done uh, taking this thing out to the woodshed yet. We are here sitting just off the lows of the pre-market session at 48 even that's taking out the former low of the move i mean if you're an intermediate trader you're looking to uh, bring in a little bit of profits here i do see 47.54 that was your low back in october of 2014 so keep an eye on that below that half and whole numbers all right, jumping over to at&t they reported last night the big blue chip stock that everybody owns for the dividend Bounced around a little bit last night on this report. We know Verizon has been murdered here. AT&T's held up well compared to Verizon. Still got a 4.73% dividend. Spencer, give us the earnings. Six, 66 cents. That's in line with the estimate. Revenues of 41.8 versus 42.04 billion. So a slight miss there on their revs as far as their fiscal year 17 revenue growth. They see that in the low single digits, and they see the adjusted EPS growth in the mid single digit range. Quiet trade, flat. Joel, give us the levels. Uh, The only stock that I've ever encouraged my daughter Dana to buy, she will not buy it. I've been begging her. I'm saying, come on, look at the dividend. Where's it going? People are going to use their phones and wireless. She has not given in yet. AT&T trading, yeah, kind of quiet here in the pre-market. I like 41 to support two lows in that area surrounding it. Looking at the mark, 41.39, so close right near the high of the session. 41 and a half, see if there's any size there, up to 40, 42 even, 42.07 was your three-day high. 42 major resistance up there, that's that high that Joel talks about, and it's an area where, you know, we've kind of been hitting these kind of stocks, like Verizon's been hitting, I think there's sellers overhead supply in AT&T. 
Uh, jumping over here to the biotech stocks. Biogen, B-I-I-B, reported earnings here this morning. Stock has been beat up because it's a drug stock. It's tra- rallying a little bit on its earnings report, though. Spencer? $5.04 versus $4.96. So beat on the EPS. Revenue 2.87 versus 2.94. So miss on the revs as far as guidance goes. Fiscal year 2017 EPS of $20.45 to $21 and a quarter. That's in line with the estimate and the revenue of guidance of 11.1 to 11.4 billion is a bit of a miss. The guidance was at, or the estimate was at $12.07 billion for their fiscal year, fiscal year revenue. Multiple going forward around 12. So a little bit cheaper than the Bristol Myers we were just talking about here. Joel Levels, Biogen, just, BIB. Just, just out of favor. You know, where's the. It uh, is. Yeah, I mean, it's just. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, uh, to quote J.C. Pratt's, why would you want to be in this thing? Well, below the 200-day moving average, 270 looks like the number here. I'd be keeping an eye on a couple lows in that area. We're trading up 371 in the pre-market. Keep an eye on the double top at the 278 area. Celgene, C-E-L-G. That stock trained down on its earnings report. It's held up better. Than some of the other biotech stocks. I own this one in my investment portfolio. I also own Bi- Biogen in my investment portfolio. I seem to own all these drug stocks in my investment portfolio. I guess my investment portfolio hasn't been doing that well lately. <laughs> but anyways, 113 boxes where we're trading here, down 1% here in the pre-market. Spencer has got the earnings. EPS a buck 61 versus a buck 59. So looking good. Revenue 2.98 versus 3.02. So a miss there as far as guidance goes. Fiscal year 17 revenue coming in in line. Uh, and then EPS is coming in in line as well. What was the number on the EPS? For the guidance, it, it's 710, yeah. 710 to 725. The estimate was at 713. Okay. So. A lot of odd lot trading here, but when things settle down, uh, 115, that's your pre-market high. Uh, I do see a pair of highs just above that at 26 and 29. So that's your resistance on the downside here. I'm just going to go a little bit longer term this one, even go to the weeklies. 110. That's what I would be hanging on to, Dennis. If I, if Big it gets, number. yeah, if it gets below one ten, Dennis, I think you should exit the remaining in your portfolio. <laughs> because, it's in there forever. Yeah, it could, it's in my don't sell portfolio. I built that one just for you. Okay, so now you're gonna go to <laughs> now you're gonna go to Western. I just move stocks over to my don't sell portfolio now. <laughs> All right, where do we go? 110, 115. Comcast. Bob Wire wants to talk Comcast. CMCSA. They also had earnings here after the bell. Stock is trading up a buck 66. And I tell you, Comcast has been a runner here for two months. 60 bucks back in November with $75 here this morning. Is this all time highs here for Comcast? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. All right. Just blowing it away. Everybody has to own cable. Everyone, go ahead, Spencer. Give the numbers. I'm shaking my head if you can't see, which of course you can't. Q4 adjusted EPS, 89 cents. That's a two cent beat. Sales, 21 billion versus 20.6. So a slight beat there as well. They also announced a two for one stock split and a five billion dollar buyback. They're also going to increase their dividend by 15 percent. You don't see enough stock splits anymore. It's the cool thing now to not split your stock. So props to Comcast for giving us a stock split. I should have upgraded this stock uh, before the earnings report. We got uh, new boxes, and we have a voice-activated remote control. So now you can, really, yeah, you can surf on the couch, and you don't even have to use your fingers. Like if you want to say uh, sports, and then uh, Pistons basketball, it will go right to the Pistons basketball That's game, cool. and then give you some other yeah. sports scores as well. Very happy with that. I uh, got a little excited here in the pre-market. I'll give you that pre-market high, 76.62. Uh, to me, the only real level of relevance I can give our listeners here is the former resistance, the former quad top at the 73.60 area comes into there. That will act as support on the upside, 76.52. That's your pre-market high. I think too many people, too many younger people in their younger generation gets TV for free here now. And that's why I'm still concerned long term with the cable companies there. I know Comcast at all time highs here, but not putting this one in my invest portfolio just simply because I think longer term prospects, you know, things are going to come down in price when it comes to TV programming. Dennis, that's me. <laughs> I, I'm one of those people. Do you have, you're, you're not a Comcast subscriber, are you? No, but my parents are. 
Yeah, oh yeah, you're not going to get the parents off the cable. You know, that's not going to happen. So, but you know, as you know, people get older, and as the younger generations, I don't think you're getting those younger generations to actually go out and pay for cable anymore. And that's my concern with a company like Comcast. And that's I kind of don't get why it just keeps going up, but people are just forgetting about that whole you know younger generation not liking to pay for anything, and you know you can get a lot of free programming on the internet. All right, let's get one more in here. We kind of fell we have off. time for one more. Okay. Yeah, we fell let's off. Let's go. Let's go forwards. This is the Motor City. F is trading while well, flat here in the pre-market. Give us the numbers here, Spencer, on Ford Motor Company. Q4 EPS 30 cents. The estimate was 31, so missed by a penny. Q4 revs 38.7 billion versus 35.2, so a good beat on the rev. It's just sitting here hanging out. I mean, this is 4.7%. People own this for the dividend. I own this for the dividend. Love the dividend. I think it's safe. And, you know, I think there's value here. That's my fundamental talk on forward. Uh, major resistance, 13. We had a quick spike up there. Nice two-day run. So we'll see if you had any uh, profit takers in there. All right. Our first guest of the day, and we're going to bring on we're gonna bring on Keith Kern. And uh, he's the editor and the author of Trader's Toolbox. And, uh... We'll see what he has in his toolbox today. We'll be right back with Keith. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Chaken Analytics. I'm your co-host, Joel Elkanen, along with Dennis Dick, Spencer Israel working the boards, and we have Keith Kern on the line. He's the founder of Traders Toolbox. Keith, how you doing on this Thursday morning? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're doing well. Dow 20,000. What more could you ask for in life? But a quick question for you here. How did, how did you come up with a Twitter handle, STT2318? Yeah, so that's a great question. I get that question a lot. And it's actually not a very, uh, a very interesting story, unfortunately. But back in college, I was in, you know, that, that was a long time ago, by the way. But I was back in college before the... Uh, you know, the advent of social media. And, and so I was looking for people to other, tr other like-minded traders and stumbled in a couple of chat rooms, um, maybe the Yahoo board. I don't even remember, but it was it's something that's not around anymore. And uh, I was, I was the short term trader guy of the group. And these guys were more, the rest of the group, uh, the guys and gals in the group were more investor types at the time. And, and I was more of the uh, active short term trader. So that's what the STT stands for, more of a short-term trader. And uh, the number was just, uh, like I said, I was in college, and I, I played baseball in college, and those were some numbers that were important to me at the time. <laughs> All right. And it's just kind of... Yeah, it's just kind of stuck. It's not a very good marketing tool these days, but I, I stuck with it. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, you're a trader and not a marketer here. And uh, Dennis and I talk about tools for the toolbox and trading, and uh, you've developed your own trader's toolbox. Uh, tell us how it came about and uh, what kind of services you offer. Yeah, great. Thanks for asking. So I've been a full-time trader uh, since 2001. Prior to that, I was, I was a broker for a couple of years. And... Um, so that's been basically my sole source of income for, for almost 16 years now. And so I, you know, if there's been a mistake to be made out there, I've probably made it over the, over the years, um, unfortunately, but you know, with the advent of social media, I've gotten quite a following on, uh, on the, you know, in the, on those avenues. And over the years, I keep getting a lot of the same questions for, you know, new traders or even traders are looking to maybe change up a little bit. And, uh, and, so what I decided to do was about three and a half years ago, we started a website, which is traderstoolbox.net. And um, 
basically have a blog there and, and some and some videos and, and just answer questions that I keep getting all the time, you know, that are obvious obvious questions for the, you know, general public, you know, folks that are looking to, to learn more about trading. And uh, just real quick, what I do is I have a nightly newsletter uh, going over the markets, trade ideas, recent trades, what worked, what didn't work, that sort of thing. I also have a, a swing alert swing alert system and um, also a live screen share chat room that I that I sit on all day long. Keith, I've actually followed you for years here, and I didn't even know it because you go by the handle at STT2318. So then suddenly when <laughs> Keith was coming on here this morning, I was like, I didn't put a two or two together. And then they said STT2. I'm like, I follow that guy. That guy always throws up great charts in my Twitter feed. <laughs> I see all these charts ready yeah. to break out all the time. I was like, I follow. I followed you for years, Keith. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome, man. It, you know, it's pretty neat. I was out to a, 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 a financial um, seminar out in uh, – Arizona a couple months ago, and it's just neat that people come and say, "Hey, you know, I I know you from Twitter, but you know, it's just it's kind of cool." My kids think I'm I'm a celebrity sometimes, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, okay. yeah, well, that's neat. Talk about your technical charts. I see them all the time. You know, how do you, you know, find these setups? First of all, are you just looking through and manually scanning through a ton of charts here every night, or do you have some systems looking for it? How do you find these nice setups? Well, I wish I had an easy answer to that question. I, that's that's one of the mo more popular questions that I get all the time. And unfortunately, even with the advent of algorithms and new software packages and all kinds of fancy you know scanners out there, I eyeball charts one by one. And the way I do that is I basically look for stocks that are in uptrends, and I do that by moving averages. So you know I'll maybe look for the 50 day over the 200 day, and then if and then on top of that, maybe the 15 day over the 50 day. And, and with that, I'll get stocks that are in solid uptrends. And then I'll just pop through those, those charts one by one and uh, just eyeball them. I found that there's no, you know, there's no algorithm out there or formula out there that can give me the setups I'm looking for. My eyeballs are still the, the best way to do that. So I'll flip through anywhere from 700 to 1500 charts a day. It takes me about a half an hour, but that's, then I, I, I put them on Twitter um, all day, every day, and I've been doing that for a long time. And, and, and if, for folks that have followed me, you'll, they'll see a certain style and a certain pattern that I look for. Would you, how would you describe your method of technical analysis? I mean, you, you know, you've explained you're pretty simple. Are you just are you looking at, uh, you know, double tops and double bottoms, triple top and triple bottoms, or do you try and throw any trickier stuff in well, what I look for in just basically simple resistance and support. I heard you guys talk about there's no such thing as resistance anymore, but, which is kind of, yeah, it's kind of a, that's a good, good joke. Um, it seems like we're just going straight up. But uh, just what I'm looking for are simple resistance and simple support areas. And the more times those areas are tested, the more I like the idea. So, and what I'm looking for personally is breakthroughs of those resistance or support areas and, 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 and as long as it's a good risk reward profile, as long as I know what my know what my risk is technically on the trade, you know I'll, I'll go for it as long as my reward you know is maybe a two to one, three to one, four to one type ratio. So I look for various patterns, but you know you can kind of see resistance and support areas with your eyeballs as you um, you know get experience looking at charts. And so it, various patterns will pop up, but. Uh, again, the more times they test those areas, the better the chances those areas will not hold. Keith, talk about you know just uh, your setups here for today. Like, what are you seeing? So you're saying you look through so many charts here. So I'm assuming you're probably looking through a ton of charts last night. Give us some hot stocks here yep. for today. Yeah, you know, yesterday was the same way, and um, so I, I did jot down a few names, some of the bigger cap names on my list. Um, the first one that I like is uh, ESV which is uh, ENSCO. It's a oil and gas play. If you pull up the chart, you can see that uh, there's significant resistance in the 12 area. And what I'm looking for in that, uh, that pattern is basically a 12 break with, with volume that is expanding. I'm, I'm a, basically a price and volume guy. And uh, so that's the thing I'm looking at. Um, Bank of America has a very nice chart as well. Uh, I know it's a boring stock and not real sexy, I guess, for a lot of traders, but Bank of America to me looks like it's in a powerful formation um, and could move could move higher. Um, you want me to keep going? Yeah, do one. Yeah, oh, yeah, keep going. We love this. 
Okay. Yeah, sure. So another one is Wendy's, W-E-N. Um, if you look at this chart, it's got significant resistance in the 14 area. Again, uh, what I'm looking for in this type of uh, situation is a 14 breakout and uh, volume that is expanding. And what I mean by expanding volume for the listeners out there is, you know, I want to see volume, uh, volume candle on the daily. That's basically, you know, obviously breaking out as well. So if, if, if a stock breaks out or breaks down and the volume isn't, isn't there, then I, I tend to avoid it. I find that the, when the volume is expanding, we have a, you know, we have a, uh, a reversal in, in um, or ba basically a confirmed breakthrough of the uh, resistance or support area. And I find that that really helps the pattern play out over time. Uh, well, Marriott is another one, uh, M-A-R. That's a nice looking uh, setup as well. If it gets to the same, maybe the 86 area. And then maybe a little sexier play for several listeners lined on this one is, uh, and it's it's a shipper. I know it's been a, that's been a crazy sector, but this one stood out yesterday um, when the other ones weren't really performing very well. And this is the EGLE uh, Eagle Bulk, and it's been a beaten down play and really didn't get the wild moves like the other shippers have over the past say month or so, whatever the time frame was. But if that gets up to seven dollars with some volume, I think that thing could get get a little nutty to the upside as well. Uh, noticing here that uh, you're kind of partial, except for the Marriott, to lower price stocks. Do you just kind of feel that it's uh, better liquidity, uh, easier to see the volume in the buyers and the sellers? Uh, how do you uh, – is you kind of more partial to lower well, price stocks? I, you know, I don't mean to be. I When I scan, you know, I'm looking basically anything under $500 I'll look okay. for. But it seems to me – it seems to me that – uh, with the with the smaller price stocks, I tend to get a little bit better percentage moves on on, on the names. Um, however, I, I I do play the uh, more expensive ones. But what I'll do typically with something that's over say fifty dollars is I'll go with the option instead of the uh, instead of the common. So to try to get that uh, you know a little bit more of a uh, you know a little bit a little bit more of a, a a beta play there, a little bit more a little bit more volatility, a little bit bigger move. All right, and uh, do you look at things on the short side as well? I know that's a that's a dirty word nowadays, but uh, do you have any <laughs> do you have any uh, picks on the short side today? I don't. You know, I scan both ways, and for probably the last six months, I have not played anything short. Um, so I'm not prepared to come in today and, and tell you uh, any short ideas. However, I will say this: when I look at the SPY. Um, I see a channel if you connect tops, and I'm thinking on the SPY that if we get up to about, uh, I don't know, the two, say the 231 area, I think we have significant resistance up there, even though it's in clean air, technically. And so I, look, I worry a little bit about, you know, the Dow breaking 20,000 that's on the mainstream media, and, you know, everyone and their brother know, is talking about the stock market now in, in the general public, which is a good thing, but maybe not so good short term. So it's a little bit concerning to me, I guess, short term that, that, um, you know, we're at top of these channels on the SPY and, and, you know, the market's getting to hit the mainstream media. And typically when that happens, we, we generally will have some sort of a pull. Now that doesn't mean we can't go a lot higher. We can, but, and I'm bullish still, but I, I, I think short term, it's time to maybe, you know, to be a little bit more conservative. Can you look at one chart for us here? Rob Hood always likes to throw in yeah. a symbol here. Uh, GTN, gray television, and then we'll let you go. Yeah, I'd, I'd be more than happy to just pull it up here. So when I look at GTN, my first thought is at a nice breakout through the 11 area uh, on expanding volume yesterday. And that chart, without getting too, in too much of the details, I could talk forever on this stuff, guys. Uh, but... It uh, looks like it measures about uh, 12 to 13, and we have some more resistance around the 12 area. So if you're in that, if you're in GTN, long GTN, I think you you know you, you get to the 12 area, and we're gonna have some resistance there. It's probably a good time to maybe start to scale and trail a position, but uh, and it's getting a little bit short term overbought. But uh, over time, it looks it looks higher to me. So short term hitting some resistance, longer term, I think that stock goes higher. Keith Kern, founder of Traders Toolbox on Twitter, STT2318. Keith, great having you on, and uh, I think we're going to get you back on again soon. I'd love to do that. Had a lot of fun, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Keith.
All right, 829, S&P's just a little bit in the red, 22.93 and a quarter. Dennis, you had an interesting comment here about his style. Uh, I don't know, like Wendy's in these stocks, and you're talking about price and volume. Why don't you just uh, reiterate that for our listeners? Uh, just again, I, I was just talking, you know, with Joel there, you know, just saying, you know, he's looking at things that are breaking out, you know, the classic breakout trades here, and he's looking for the setup, but he's looking at them right before they break out. And it's interesting enough, a lot of times when you see something top in the same area, two or three times, we say this on the show a lot, there's size there that is holding it down. You know, there's size in the book. There's a big order there. And then once that order gets taken out, it actually creates the volume as well. So then, you know, you're going to see, and a technician's going to notice that as well. So he's looking for the setup ahead of time. And when these things get taken out, sometimes they go and you can see bank america classic setup here it's been up to this 2350 area multiple times 2340 actually but if you look in the book you know i always like to go look at order flow here bac open book you can see that 2340 there's 20,000 shares at 2344 there's 79,000 shares at 2345 there's 33,000 shares at 2350 there's 380,000 shares you're talking about you know six seven hundred thousand shares here in the next 10 cents that you know is a lot of volume for the stock to chew through. Now, if it does chew through there, then it goes. But that's sometimes why a stock will top out in the same area multiple times. It's sometimes for technical reasons, but sometimes those if you go and dig deeper into the technicals, sometimes you know it's for order flow reasons. And you know a lot of these you know stocks top out three, four times in a row. It's because there's big size in the book, of right. being a big seller in the book holding it down. All right, let's get back to the earnings parade here, Dennis. Uh, what else we need to cover? Oh, where do you want to go? Let's go a couple airlines here. We got Southwest Air flying here. I beat you to the pun this morning. I used that yesterday on Boeing, too, so I guess my puns are getting old. LUV, $51.40 here. Spencer, how are the earnings? Q4 EPS, $0.75 cents versus $0.70. Cents. Revenues are 5.08 versus $5.03 billion. So beat on both. Uh, they see either Q4 load factor 84.4%. That's a slight increase from the previous of 84.1%. Multiple highs in the 52 area. That's, you know, where it looks like it, you know, wants to try to fight to. Was it there already this morning? I haven't looked at the pre market. 5150. Trade. That's your pre market high, yeah. man. I think. Oh, this is a big move for Southwest. Two bucks, I think. And uh, so much overhead supply at so 52. Much, yeah, I mean, I think this is one of these stocks that uh, if you had your scans and you can know, okay, if uh, you know, if Southwest Airlines opened up uh, two dollars, let's say twenty-five times in the last two years, I would have to say you're shorting it. You know, somewhere near the open, I think your percentage on the win side could be pretty good. Uh, though we don't make any stock recommendations here on the show. I tell you, a lot of resistance. If I was long any of these underneath calls, I'd be rigging to register at or near the open, hoping for the $52 area. You also had JetBlue earnings, JBLU. That stock's just hanging out here. Did get initial lift, though. Has kind of sagged back down to settlement here now. JetBlue, Spencer, JBLU. Nothing too exciting. Uh Q4 EPS, 50 cents. They beat by a penny. Estimate was 49 cents. Sales of 1.6 versus 1.64 billion. 23 is your overhead resistance there. I don't think it's already obviously come off those highs. Where to get to earlier, Joel? Uh, your pre-market high in JetBlue, the quick spike was to 22.50. Now hanging out under $22. Little gap in there to fill. So 21.50 is your temporary support. Let's see what happens if it can clear 22, 22.15 yesterday's high. And then you also had a high at 22.11. So pretty well-defined levels here in JetBlue. Going back to last night, a lot of big companies reported. Let's go to eBay because this one I tried trading a couple of times. I know Ace was trading it there too. Uh, eBay here trading up 7% here in the pre-market. It got up to that 33 level a couple of times. It did go through it there. I shorted it once off 33 and I made some money. It came back up there the second time and I was like, eh, I don't know. I probably should have did it again. It did go through 33, but then it's peeled back off there. So there is major resistance up at 33, but it's a big move for eBay. Spencer, what was the report? Q4 report was nothing great. 54 cents EPS, that's in line. Sales, 2.4 billion. Also in line, the guidance, though, this is what happened. Q1 adjusted EPS of 46 to 48 cents. That's a little bit lower than the estimate, which was 50 cents. 
sales 2.17 versus through 2.21 billion that was the range of the sales guidance 2.21 was the estimate they also uh, issued some fiscal year 17 guidance adjusted EPS a buck 98 to two dollars and three cents also lower than the two dollars and seven cent estimate and the sales guidance for the fiscal year was 9.3 to 9.5 billion and 9.36 was the estimate so in line there I mean, really, nothing blowing it away in that report, but it's a funny market, and this is a sleepy little stock that hasn't been doing much here, and everybody, well, it awoke here on this earnings report, but it's so interesting that it gets to these levels. I mean, it got right, and I don't know what the after-hours high was exactly. Joel can tell us in a second, but, you know, it got 33.19. I think that's kind of right around where it got to when I was watching it trade. Joel, what was the after-hours high? Janice and Ace were looking at their monthly charts in the heat of the moment, and they noticed two monthly highs, one at 33. 303 that was in October the other uh, monthly high in the old time high 3319 so the pre-market high 3317 so wow, people are, yeah, right look at that there. nice technicals I mean still respect it now I mean who knows what happens when uh, you know the yep. big volume comes in but uh, got to respect there anything above 33 3319 that's your all time high all right, we're going to take our second and final break of the day, and uh, what a time to bring on Jeff Hirsch. He's the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac, and I was thinking of having him on earlier in the month, but I figured let's get him on here the later in the month and uh, get his evaluation of the market here in January. We'll be right back with Jeff Hirsch. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks. Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's pre-market prep brought to you by Chaikin Analytics. We are on the line with Jeffrey Hirsch. He's the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac, started by his father, Yale Hirsch. Jeff, how you doing this morning? I am great. How are you guys? All right. So uh, I went this. Uh, I don't know why the Dow hit thirty-eight thousand eight hundred and twenty, and how you can profit from it. What year did you write that book? Uh, the forecast was initially made in May of 2010 as we went to press with the 2011 Stock Traders Almanac and it also appeared in uh, our newsletter article at the time. And then the book came out a year later in March, uh, April 1, March 31st, 2011. And how did you come up with that number? Well, it's based on a forecast that, that Yale put out. And just before I get into that, we um, referenced it a little bit yesterday in our blog post, uh, and it's updated throughout um, our, our, our website and in, in several blogs just with, with the, where we are, you know, where we've come from there. But it's based upon a um, excuse me, long-term cycle Yale discovered back in 76, where he made a similar forecast of Dow 3420 uh, by 1990, which was a 500% move from the 74 low based upon the previous market moves following war and inflation after World War I and World War II, and our big chart that shows the whole history. It's actually a semi lock chart, so it shows the gains um, a little more rel uh, relatively um, relative to previous years at different levels. And um, what we found was coming into, you know, 2001, 2002, after 9-11 and the big, you know, uh, uh, Iraq um, uh, invasion, I guess. Uh, we found the market behaving very similarly than it did back in 74, 76, and we came out of it. And uh, then we had that secondary, um, actually ultimate low, the second, you know, part of the, the three, 
uh, the triple bottom there in 09. And um, we started tracking this way back in 0102, and, and it started to come to fruition. And that's when we realized after we came off that low in uh, 09 or in early 2010 that we were in a similar point um, as we were in the you know mid to late 70s. And um, we've continued to track it from there. When I put the book out, uh, we did a projection, which I sort of went a little uh, snake eyed, if you will, and, and looked at all the different cycles and patterns. And, and we've adjusted a little bit since. I, I kept the initial forecast so I could see how um, close we were when the time comes. But it's basically, um, you know, the the crux of secular bull and secular bear markets. And uh, I think we're at the obviously we're almost halfway there. We we we've uh, you know we made the first forecast about that ten thousand. And, um, you know, we're looking for the couple of the last two factors. You have war and inflation, and you have political functionality, which remains to be seen if we've got to change it with the Trump administration here or not, and then some sort of what I call a culturally enabling paradigm-shifting technology. Um, maybe it's robotics, biotech, uh, energy tech this time around, but things like the car and the uh, Internet and microprocessors and television and that sort of thing. So huh. that's the sort of uh, you know, executive summary of that. How do you uh, think the Trump administration is going to affect, you know, the next four years here? What do you, first of all, think of, you know, Trump, you know, obviously, you know, he's very, you know, with his Twitter account out there in the public, but also, you know, with what he's doing here to obviously, you know, bring more jobs back into the U.S. here. How, what does that mean for the markets overall? Well, I mean, if it's, if, if it's effective, it's, um, and he's successful, it means uh, positive things for the market. I think there's going to be a lot of pushback, you know, initially out of the blocks here. I mean, you've got half the country with him and half the country against yeah. him. Um, you know, aside from the Electoral College, uh, I, mean, I live in an area where um, there's there's a, 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 a different type of bias. Uh, but, you know, being in the um, greater New York area, um, New York City, that is. Uh, but I think it's it's crucial. And that's what our annual forecast was based upon. We basically had a base case. You know, uh, a worst case, a base case, and a, and a great case, and you know, leaning towards the base where he's probably going to have to compromise. We're looking at sort of you know middling, uh, you know, double digit gains, and um, if he can execute really well, we're looking at you know, uh, fifteen twenty percent plus. Um, and then if he fumbles and continues to, um, you know, or at least fails at doing things and, and gets caught up in his Twitter account and doesn't create that job growth then we're going to have ourselves potentially a post-election year bear market or at least a, a flat, you know, really blase year. So it really depends on execution. Jeff, what I'm about sure when... you can do it all with executive order, but go ahead. What about in sectors like the financials that have already had a 30% run? I mean, you're a technical guy here. This is a big yeah. move in two months, you know. Isn't a lot of, you know, maybe this Trump, you know, deregulation already baked into these stocks? Wholeheartedly, we've got a couple of small regional stocks in our portfolio that I, I, I own also and that, um, you know, are, are in our newsletter portfolio that are one of them is up 50 percent. So I'm looking at taking some profits off of that. You know, there's a, there's a couple of different ways you take profits. There's a small stock. Sometimes you do a sell a half on a double or if it's a little bit larger. Maybe we'll up 40 percent, sell 20 percent as it goes up. So I think it's time to, you know, take some things off uh, or at least be prepared to and get ready to. Um, when we get into after the first 100 days and uh, into the end of the best six months, April, May, we're going to probably tighten up stops and, and, and you know, hold on to our big winners but, but be protective of those games and, and start to take some things off. So I think you're right. Things have come a long way, and there's a lot to prove. Um, he's going to have to have the banks uh, uh, to, to, to create economic growth and jobs. They're, they're the, the, the fuel of it, the, the catalyst. Um, but – yeah, it's it's come come a, uh, quite a ways already, and um, bullish sentiment is is screaming. It's backed off a little bit, but uh, I, you know there's not too many bears out there. Talk about the bullish sentiment here. Now that we've hit Dow twenty thousand, Joel and I were having a little bit of an argument earlier on in the show, and obviously, you know, me and Joel are both S and P guys because we've been trading, you know, prop for a long time, and you know, I don't even have the Dow indicator on my screen. But from a psychological perspective, you know, I was arguing it means a lot. I think, you know, Dow twenty thousand oh, yeah. people think the market's back. Maybe just talk about the psychology behind Dow twenty thousand. Well, let me ask you a quick question. Did you guys trade the January break today? With the, I mean, today, this month with the S and P's. We had a nice little typical January break. I know that's a big 
S and P futures pit kind of trade. Did you get into that at all? No, we haven't. But tell us about that it's too. It's over. But I, I tried, and I wasn't quick enough to cover. I should have covered on Monday. Uh, but we had the the thought right. I just didn't execute personally. It was just a little trade with the you know the um, SDS and the SPXU. But it it was there for the taking if you were nimble enough to grab it. Um, but with sentiment, you know, uh, there's a couple things I watch. I mean, the VIX. Uh, I don't find it as forward-looking as we'd all like it to be. Uh, it's kind of not really a sentiment indicator. It's an indicator of how volatile the market is presently. Uh, I think we want it to be an indicator it's of, of, of uh, the future, but it's not so much. I look at things like the investors' intelligence, bullish and bearish advisors, and also put call, equity-only put call, which is really um, – you know, where, where people are putting their money uh, with how many puts and calls they're buying, um, showing where they think the market's going. Um, there's other sentiment indicators that other people use, but high bullish sentiment is um, something that can persist for a long time. Uh, you get a better indication on the downside with really high, you know, capitulating bearish sentiment. If you see a big spike down in, in uh, put call, especially equity only put call. And I use the weekly as well uh, for a little bit of a smoothing factor. But yeah, we're extended. We're up there. I think, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of buyers out there. Uh, I think we can still push this thing for another quarter or two, but um, I'll, I'll draw your attention to a chart we've, we've put out there uh, before um, about the post-election year pattern with all post-election years plotted against um, first, uh, new, you know, first-term post-election years versus new Democrats first term and new Republicans first term. And all four lines sort of stay together uh, until about – um, June, May, June, and then the new Republican line tends to dip lower for that, you know, week, uh, sell in May, we're six months period. Um, after, you know, what we've seen here is new Republicans tend to come in and, and take care of business right away. It's the sort of conservative, uh, dogma is that we know what we want and we're going to do it out of the block. So we're not going to uh, deliberate too much on it, more of a progressive mindset. And we're seeing some of that here. So I think selling may might be important this year. Uh, I know uh, I also did a recent study with the January trifecta indicators that we use, the Santa Claus rally, the first five days, and the January barometer, and how selling may uh, behaves when all three are positive, a positive trifecta, we call it. And it's pretty good. Um, it's, you know, about 8% in the worst six months versus, you know, uh, low single digits to flat, depending upon how you slice it and what, and what, and that was in post-election years specifically. So, you know, there's some converging factors there, but I'm going to be getting much more concerned uh, come spring when we see what's really going to happen coming out of Washington, especially uh, Trump and, the, and Congress working, working together or not. Jeff, tell us about that, uh, that January trade or the pit trade you were talking about, what, uh, what the setup was. I mean, I was, I was looking to, for a break out of the consolidation, and it, it just it came up and caught us you know, very quickly two days ago. What was the setup you were looking at? Well, it's, a, it's, it's right out of the com old Commodity Traders Almanac, um, but something that, you know, uh, Laura from, the, from the, the Chicago pits, uh, that there's this after the Santa Claus rally, you know, which ends second day or so of, of, of trading day of January, um, you know, you get a pullback of, uh, I guess, about 3.5% uh, on average, sometimes steeper, till about the uh, middle of the month. I think it was the 21st, trade, the 21st calendar day of this month. Um, and, you know, if you see a nice rally into that uh, uh, first few days of the year, you have your January breaks. It was a little, I mean, the... The psychology is, is it's a, a little uh, New Year profit taking, you know, um, not wanting to take profits at the end of the last year, uh, and then people start taking them, and that's the the setup was there this year where we were rallied into it, um, and uh, you know we got a nice little dip. Too bad I didn't cover on time. <laughs> All right, Jeffrey Hirsch, editor in chief of the Stock Traders Almanac. You can find that at uh, www.stocktradersalmanac.com. A longtime veteran of the market, Jeff, thanks for coming on. We'll speak to you again soon. Always a pleasure, gentlemen. Take care. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Uh, going green again here, Dennis. Uh, a battle of the bulls and bears here at the closing price. The all-time closing high price of 22.94 even.
this is going to be a stock pickers day. And, you know, we talk about that, you know, with stock pickers. Well, you know, when some stocks going up, some stocks going down at the bottom line, the market goes nowhere because you've got half the stocks going up and half the stocks going down. I mean, with so many earnings reports here, I'm looking at my screen. I can't really see a clear leading sector. I mean, financials were unbelievable. So they had a great run. You wonder, you know, you're seeing the financials start to go green here again. You wonder, you know how I love my two day move. And that was a big move for the financials yesterday. So I wonder, you know, if you get some follow through here in some of the banks but you know there is overhead supply like we talked on bank america you know from 2340 to 2350 it's going to be a tough sledding because there's just so many sellers in the book but you know so that's one sector that i'm kind of keeping my eye on but you know everything else is just mixed you know because there's just so many earnings reports you know you got whirlpool here trading down 10 points in the pre-market on their earnings report and you got other stocks you know like uh just going into some of your technology stocks like a xilinx is trading up xl and x you've got and NOW, which is service now, trading up 7% of the pre-market on their earnings report. So, you know, you've got some decent reports from tech. But then you've also got Qualcomm here, which is in the doghouse. And it's funny how sentiment dictates everything more than anything else. Qualcomm got killed there, you know, with the lawsuit with Apple there a couple of days ago. And, you know, they're beating it up on earnings here again. You know, same thing with Bristol Myers. It's like, you know, once they start hating on a stock, they find reasons to sell it. Even on a stock that might have an okay earnings report, sometimes sentiment is more important than the earnings report itself. Uh, but, you know, let's jump into a few other just earning stocks here just because we only got a few minutes left. We obviously can't get to them all. If there's any individual stock that you want to talk about, let us know there in the chat because there's a lot of movers there and a lot of earning stocks here to cover this morning. Western Digital, though, is one I want to talk about with you, Joel, because you've been, you know, obviously on the right side of this move. We had a question about it earlier in the chat. It got the big move off the Seagate earnings and then it reports, you know, and it reports OK and they rallied it. But then they actually hit it after hours. And now it's come all the way back here wdc give us your technical thoughts because you've been all over this one all right todd your pre-market high is at 82 and a quarter uh i mean i'm even getting a little bit nervous on this one here uh after the huge rally so keep an eye 82 and a quarter didn't even hit that in yesterday's session we're actually not even above yesterday's high which is 81 26 so that's a good level on the upside uh, 802, that was the close. We're holding above that. Big number on the downside. Maybe I'll just put a little stop in it, like 7850 or something. Because if we take out that 7910, I could easily see us filling the gap at 7652, as that was uh, Tuesday's high. So a lot of air in this thing. Uh, of course, if you had the options, you probably paid up on the calls or whatever. They're going to suck that premium out of it right away today so a lot of air underneath 81 and 26 that was yesterday's high fuzzy wants to know about mattel if i look at my loser board for today covering all the stocks in the usa mat here is number Woo. three and that doesn't include penny stocks but it includes everything else anyways mattel trading down 13 percent in the pre-market they are murdering this stock on its earnings report spencer did they sell say they're never going to sell any more toys again what did they say <laughs> Q4 just EPS of 52 cents versus a 71 cent estimate. Ooh. So bad news, the bear is there. Sales 1.834 billion versus 1.96 billion. So more bad news. Stock trading to an interesting level here, though, Joel, because this is the level that we got down to back at the end of the year, looking at December 29th. We got down to 27.36. We're through that right now. We're kind of hanging out right at the lows. Actually, right before that, I missed that other low. We got down to 27.27. So we're hanging out here right around where we were bottoming at the beginning of December before we had a big run up here in January. So getting back its entire January gain, it was one of your better performers there all in one day. What do you think on Mattel here? Uh, I mean, you know, you get a $30 stock, $31 stock, down four points. So if you're short, you know, why not ring the register here near the $27 level? I'm looking at, Dennis, you talked about the pre-market low, twenty six ninety six. Just hanging out. I think there's a little bit of a buyer there standing at 27 uh, You know, if 27 is not good enough for you, if it gets in the lower 26 handle, 2611 that was your low in february of 2016 it's just do sympathy hasbro is getting the beats here too poor hasbro they don't even say anything it's down four and a half bucks <laughs> in the pre-market because obviously what mattel does they feel hasbro might do the same thing stock trade now five percent in the pre-market here giving back half of its gains for 2017 all because of mattel 
Joel? Joel sleeping. Joel's here. I'm here. I'm here. Um, let's. I figured you'd do some levels. Uh, I don't. I know. I was just. Starting. You don't want to do levels on. You don't have any levels on Hasbro. I'll give you a level in Hasbro. <laughs> I'll give you a level aside your head. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, trading down here in sympathy. Eighty-one, eighty-two is your pre-market low. I'll just keep an eye on this eighty-one thirty-one low, January twelfth. Now this is, I mean, they're getting really beat up here for what Mattel did. So I, you know, it's a sympathy play. I think you're really lucky here if you've been short here. It's went from seventy-eight to eighty-seven. So I don't know. I don't know when when's Hasbro supposed to report. I mean, they're uh, which one's linked to Star Wars, Dennis? Is that is that Mattel or is that Hasbro? I think it's Hasbro. Hasbro Star yeah. Wars. I'm okay, sure. so then you just Mattel's got... Barbie, isn't it? Yeah, and, and canon stuff. Yeah, so uh, I, yeah, but not. I, a... I, I would. I, I think it. I think they're overdoing it here in the Hasbro. Las Vegas Sands DC wants to know about. They did report earnings here after the bell, and they're beating this one up here too. It's down to the tune of four point four percent in the pre market. Spencer LVS results. Q four adjusted EPS sixty two cents versus sixty six, so miss there. Sales three point oh eight versus three point one one million dollars, so miss there. Stock down at fifty four bucks here in the pre market. Joel fifty three thirty five. That is your pre market low. You're getting into an area where you don't have many lows to lean on here. Fifty three fifty two. That was your low back on January fourth. The low of the year at fifty two fifty four. Wind Resorts obviously getting head in sympathy as well as MGM. Both of them trading down more than a percent off of the LVS earnings here. Uh, a couple other ones just from last night there that we did not hit. Um, I did want to do the ServiceNow results because I just mentioned it there, and I never actually uh, gave you the n numbers there. NOW is one of the big winners here today, up 7% here in the pre-market. I think it's actually lifting CRM in the pre-market here as well. If you look at Salesforce.com, it's trading up over 1% in the pre-market as well. And I'm pretty sure that's on piggybacking off of ServiceNow. NOW, earning Spencer, what do they have to say? $0.25 cents versus $0.23. Cents. We have news of three, 391.7 versus 379 million dollars so nice nice figure on the revenues uh, as far as q1 sales guidance they see that at 406 to 411 million dollars the estimate was 402 so a good number there they also see their fiscal year 17 sales at 1.82 to 1.85 billion 1.8 even was the estimate so a good number there and the stock, like we said, trading up 7% in the pre-market. Quick levels on that, and then I want to just jump over to Salesforce. Uh, blowing away the former all-time high, uh, which came in at 91.28. Uh, pre-market high, 93.47. Uh, really hasn't backed off more than uh, a buck, buck and a half for there. So see what happens again if it gets up to 93.50. CRM is lifting here, too, and CRM is back. I mean, ever since they said they weren't taking over Twitter, the stock has pretty much been straight up, and we are right back up near the highs that we were back when we gapped up back on January the 18th, and when we got up to $80.37. I mean, it could test that today. We're at seventy nine fifty here this morning. I got to think there's probably something kicking around 80 bucks just because of the big whole psychological number. First time back to that big level there in two months. I go to the book. I can't quite see that many levels there because it's already filled up, but CRM... I I gotta think this price. I'm kicking around eighty. Uh, just to give you the exact level, Dennis referring to eighty thirty seven. That was your November sixteenth high. And uh, you know the things with Twitter. I mean, the, you know the takeover. They they tagged it uh, bad on that. And it's interesting how it got back to the low that you had in late September. Now you're on the string of the five conservative up days. We'll see what happens. Not only did you have some highs at 80 in November, but you also had a series of highs back in August and then probably had a bad earnings report, then you gapped down. So big level, 80 to 80.37 up on the upside on Salesforce.com. Only two minutes left here. You're just speaking of Twitter. Twitter has 132,000 share buy-in balance here. So some buy -in money coming into, you know, it's interesting. GoPro gets a short squeeze a couple days ago. You're starting to see some life in Fitbit. You're starting to see some life in Twitter here as well. You know, these stocks that, you know, have, you know, higher short interest and have been out of favor for a long time. Starting to show a little bit of life. So you wonder if there might be a potential for a trade there uh, just short term, though. Alibaba, 154,000 to buy here. That stock has been struggling up near the 105 area. I think there's still some resistance 
resistance up there. It's at 104.68 here in the pre-market. It'd be interesting if it can open up near that area. Uh, your banks all have buy-in balances here, and they are showing a little bit more strength even than when we mentioned them 15 minutes ago. Citigroup, 65000 to buy. Bank of America, 52000 to buy. Morgan, 22000 to buy. JP Morgan, 59000 to buy. So banks are looking a little bit strong here again, maybe piggybacking off of yesterday's rally. Nike, 35000 to buy. Berkshire Hathaway, BRK.B. We're going to talk about that one a lot. It's got 44000 to buy here this morning, too. So we're starting to see a few buy imbalances come in. The market was weaker earlier, but we're almost back to scratch. And I wonder if it isn't because a few of these little buy imbalances are starting to show up. Uh, just a quick look uh, for Spinner at Estee Lauder EL. Uh, trade made a nice high yesterday at 82. <clears throat> Let's see what we've done in the pre market. Not a lot of Nothing. volume trading. Zero. Man, oh, man, that 82, that just looks like a major level. You had that high there yesterday. Clear sailing if, in fact, we can hold that 82 with the bid. All right, 859. Spencer, do you want to wrap up today's show and tell folks we got a good show lined up for tomorrow? Yep, we're going to go a little long tomorrow because we've got three guests for you. First, at 815, we've got Christian Magoon of Magoon Capital. He's an ETF guy. 835, we've got Kenny Glick. Hit the bid radio. He just wants to tell us how amazing his Dow 20K call was, which it was. I mean, he made it uh, a, a while back. So we're going to talk to Kenny Glick. Always love having him on. He's maybe our most entertaining guest. And then at 9, we're going to have Gordon Johnson on the show. He is the managing director at Axiom Capital. He uh, knows the uh, solar space better than probably anybody out there and he made an excellent excellent call yesterday issued a midday note about uh, caterpillar was on the money uh with their report so we're going to talk to gordon johnson tomorrow that's our show for the day hope everyone enjoyed it want to remind you that today's show is brought to you by chicken analytics with their groundbreaking stock research tools including the proven chicken power gauge rating and stock discovery engine Chicken Analytics simplifies complex investment decisions and it's all presented in an easy to understand platform. To learn more, visit chickenanalytics.com forward slash pre market. That's chicken, C H A I K I N analytics.com forward slash pre market. That's it for us. Just remember that all the information, material, and content from our show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice. Have a good rest of your day. We'll be back with you folks tomorrow. Whether you're a short-term swing trader or a long-term investor, you need to check out Thinkorswim, brought to you by TD Ameritrade. There's a reason why Thinkorswim has been named the number one trading platform, because it has it all. With Thinkorswim, you can trade stocks, options, futures, forex, and virtually every other type of order. Get notifications on mobile devices and interact with other traders in chat rooms. You can also use technical indicators and see the latest investing and trading education in Think Money magazine. If you want to keep up with the markets, you need Thinkorswim. To experience everything Thinkorswim has to offer, open a TD Ameritrade account today. Thinkorswim, the online trading platform for traders and investors. TD Ameritrade, member SIPC. All investing involves risks.